There are broadly two schools of thought as to when and uh, why Galatians was written, and uh, naturally I take the right one rather than the wrong one, but I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, in most parts of Germany and in many parts of America, it is still believed that Galatians was written in about the middle of Paul's career, and it was written to people in northern Turkey, the northern bit of Galatia, and it was written after the Jerusalem conference, whatever that may have been, and that Galatians 2 actually refers to the Jerusalem conference that we know roughly from Acts 15. The other view, which I have been long persuaded of, and there are actually quite a lot of other scholars who agree, is that Galatians was written after Paul's first missionary journey to the churches in South Galatia. Interestingly, a recent book by a Roman historian who's studied the archeology span of that part, Anatolia, um, is absolutely categorical. It must be South Galatia, and, and you really can't have it any other way, but these are debates which go on in the commentaries and the articles and so on. And if that is so, then the situation goes like this. Paul makes that first missionary journey, Acts 13 and 14, through the cities of uh, Lystra, Iconium, Derbe, and of course Pisidian Antioch itself. The, geog the geography and the naming of different regions is, is really quite tricky, like when in, in Scotland we talk about the borders or the lowlands or whatever, and these don't exactly fit with the different county names and uh, regional jurisdictions. In the same way, if you look at a map of ancient Turkey, it's a mare's nest of names going this way and that. But basically, South Galatia, those cities that Paul visits in Acts um, 13 and 14, and then after that, Paul is back home in Antioch, and it's at that point that then he is enjoying fellowship with Jews and Gentiles in Antioch. And then Peter comes and joins in with that and doesn't worry because after all, Peter's had his experience in Acts 10 and 11 in the house of Cornelius. And so Peter is quite happy to share fellowship with the Gentiles. But then some people come from Jerusalem, from James, and Peter gets cold feet and withdraws. And then according to this reading, Paul hears that similar people have gone to the churches in South Galatia and have said, no, actually, you're getting it all wrong. Paul's only given you half of the message. Yes, he's told you about Jesus, and that's wonderful. You've experienced this spiritual awakening, but actually you need to become part of the true family, the family of Abraham, the ancient people of God. And for that, of course, you need to get circumcised. And that, I believe, is the historical situation because this is then before the Jerusalem conference. And perhaps Paul, even on his way to Jerusalem to hammer this one out in public with the other apostles, he dashes off this letter to say, don't do it, don't go there, that's a false trail. You'll give up everything that you've gained if you go that way. So this is easily Paul's most polemical letter, and as a result, it sometimes feels quite confused. He's switching from one foot to another and from one tack to another in, in his argument. But that, I think, is the historical situation. I therefore date Galatians very early, that is to say in the late 40s, and I put it either from Antioch itself or somewhere in that area as Paul is preparing to go south for the Jerusalem conference. It's clear in Galatians that Paul has some particular opponents in mind. And it's hard to know precisely who these people are or indeed what to call them. It used to be the case that people would refer to them as the Judaizers, but actually that's a misnomer because the word Judaizing or to Judaize in, in literature of the time doesn't mean people who are persuading other people to become Jews. It means Gentiles who are trying to become Jews. So if you like, the Galatians themselves are the would-be Judaizers and the opponents who some commentators simply called the teachers or the missionaries, are Jewish Christian missionaries who have gone to the churches of Galatia to say to them, actually, you ought to go the whole way. And this means taking on board the whole law, um, the, the food laws, the Sabbath, and particularly then circumcision. Why were they doing this? It may simply have been, um, and many have advanced theories like this, that as Pharisaic Jews, which they probably were if they were taking the trouble to do this, they were really worried that if people were claiming to be part of, in some sense, the family of Israel, while not keeping the covenant properly, they were actually letting the side down big time. There are many texts in which we find rabbis saying things like, if only all Israel would keep the law for a, a single day, then 
the, the, the age to come would dawn. The Messiah would come and it would, all, it would all work out. And so it may be that they're just thinking, these people are blaspheming. They don't know what they're talking about. We've got to sort them out. There may be a more subtle reason as well, which some have recently suggested. That whole area of central and southwestern Turkey, we know from archaeology, was a major center at this period of the imperial cult the new Roman religion, worshipping the goddess Roma itself and worshipping the empire, the emperor, the emperor's family. New temples to the emperor were springing up. Great uh, games and festivities were organised which would involve um, ritual adoration of or allegiance to the emperor, worshipping him as a god or whatever. Now, interestingly, the Jews were exempt from this because the Romans had found a century or so earlier that the Jews are a pretty recalcitrant lot and that you could try to force them to worship pagan gods, but they would cheerfully roll over and bare their necks and say, well, you just have to kill us in that case. And they meant it. And so the Romans, who were pretty pragmatic about that sort of thing, said, OK, OK, if it really matters that much to you, here's the deal. You Jews, you needn't worship our gods and our emperor, but what you must do is you must pray to your god for our state. And the Jews were quite happy to do that. We will pray for you. We won't pray to you. So that, that was the deal. And sometimes that's summarized with the phrase religio licita, permitted religion. Now, all very well until along come these people who believe in Jesus as the Jewish Messiah and say, well, we are the true Jews. We are the real sort of Jews now. So we're not going to worship the Roman emperor either. Big trouble because the Roman authorities are going to scratch their heads and say, so now you don't have to be a Jew. You're claiming this permission, even though you haven't got that um, ethnic badge. And then it's big trouble for the local Jewish communities who will then put pressure on the Jewish Christians. Now, this is all supposition, but actually it works extremely well in terms of the social pressure that we can imagine, the political. The, you know, this is what it feels like on the street. There are people saying, hey, you're letting the side out. We're going to get in trouble. Watch out. Who do those people think they are? And so the missionaries, the emissaries, the, the, the people who've come probably from Jerusalem to Galatia are saying, look, for goodness sake, you lot get circumcised and then you'll all be bona fide proper Jews and then there won't be any more trouble, will there? And so that is the point at which Paul sees red and says, no, this really won't do.